America has always had the race problem, whether it was with the Indians or whether it was African Americans. When your country tells you you don't belong, it's not a concentration camp in the sense of that we think of as Auschwitz. There was not a plan to, to exterminate these people, but certainly they were rounded up because of their race and because they were physically different and because we were afraid of them. The war came along and so we lost it all. This was an extreme moment of injustice in American history and the pain of it continues. What happened to us was a mass hate crime. It shouldn't have happened. The men and the women who were affected by this carry the betrayal of their, their country basically turning its back on them. This government took away our innocence. I mean, it, as, a, as a young kid, we learned that, uh, that freedom and justice for all meant freedom and justice for some, not all. We were basically second-class citizens. Colorado Experience is a co-production of Rocky Mountain PBS and History Colorado. History Colorado brings history to life for audiences of all ages. Through exhibits, collections, and historic preservation programs throughout the state, History Colorado connects people to the stories, places, and heritage of Colorado's past that provide perspectives on today and inspire our choices for tomorrow. Find out more at www.historycolorado.org. Additional funding provided by El Pomar Foundation and the Betcher Foundation, celebrating 75 years of philanthropy in Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations and from viewers like you, thank you. My dad bought this bare land. He planted uh, peaches and uh, walnuts. And then we, while those trees were growing up, um, he planted vegetables. And uh, so we were small truck farmers. And uh, then just as we were to harvest our first uh, good crop of, of peaches, the war came along. So the driving factor that, that really spurred internment was Pearl Harbor, uh, the attack of the Japanese Empire on the United States, this surprise attack. Um, angered a lot of Americans. Uh, and they were looking for somebody to scapegoat, somebody to blame for this. When Pearl Harbor happens and it's bombed, it's as if the Japanese in the US had done it. And people had a really hard time distinguishing between Japanese nationals and these Japanese Americans who had chosen to be here, and many of them who hadn't chosen to be here because two thirds of them were American citizens. I was uh, 12 years old and I was over at a uh, neighbor's farm because I was picking yellow delicious. I was all by myself. My father came by and picked me up. And that's when he heard that uh, Pearl Harbor, you know, had happened. Well, of course, we didn't know what to expect, you know. The Pacific Coast had been a site of, of anti-Asian sentiment for a very long time. 
Um, you have the Chinese Exclusion Act. You have various property acts that, tell, that um, involve people of Asian descent not being able to own property, not being able to become American citizens. So we, I, I always feel like this history needs to start earlier when we understand that there is this, this discomfort with Asian immigrants of all stripes um, coming to the U.S. The Japanese were identified as a potential security threat on the West Coast because nobody was quite sure whether they were loyal to the United States or to the Empire of Japan. A lot of that had to do with a lot of pre-war racism. Uh, the feeling that the Japanese had never felt welcome in places like California or Oregon or Washington. And the wartime hysteria allowed Californians to push for the expulsion of the Japanese. Patriotism and loyalty. You know, this is the only country we have, born and raised, here, taught all the songs, celebrated the 4th of July. I mean, what other country could we be loyal to? Executive Order 9066 allowed the military leadership to declare a zone, an emergency zone, on the West Coast in the states of California, Oregon, and Washington, in which they could relocate any of the civilian population they deemed as a security threat. And the interesting thing about this is that nowhere in the document is the word citizen. We were called non-aliens. Ralph Carr was the governor of Colorado at the beginning of World War II. And when he found out about the relocation, he said to Japanese Americans living on the West Coast, that they could come to Colorado and live here freely and that they would be welcomed into the Colorado community. The citizens of Colorado by and large were opposed to the Japanese coming into the state. Many of the Coloradans had the same fears as Californians about the loyalty of the Japanese. Uh, they were afraid that the Japanese would come in and they would uh, spy on Americans, they would sabotage the produce, they would uh, uh, one person said, bringing the Japs, as they used, the term they used, bringing the Japs here is a knife in the back of good, loyal Coloradans. When we found out we were coming to Colorado, I only knew it was a square state. And I, we thought that there were Indians, you know, selling blankets. To give you an idea how <laughs> ignorant we were. Imagine if you were a teenager from Los Angeles, you were born in the United States, you'd never been to Japan, you spoke English, you were an average ordinary American. Suddenly you found yourself transplanted uh, out into southeastern Colorado. You were given one week to pack up all of your worldly goods. You could bring two suitcases, no more. Simple everyday items like cameras and radios were forbidden. Well, you know, first of all, we went to a first camp, which was in California. There was this assembly center, which was in Merced. It resembled a, a prison camp in the sense that um, it was surrounded by barbed wire and they had uh, very hastily built barracks um, in the center part of the, of the fairground, racetrack. And we lived there for a three, three months, and then we were put on trains and taken to Amanchi. Well, when we took this train trip, we were on a converted coal train. We were on the train for three and a half, you know, days. And we arrived at night. And the name of the town, I understand now that's pronounced Grenada, but we always pronounced it Granada, being from California. And the following morning was the first time, of course, that we saw what the whole area looked like. Needless to say, coming from California, it was a real big shock to see this nothingness. I shall never forget. And I thought, what, nothing, nothing? I don't see any trees, I don't see anything, you know? All this very desolate looking area, you know? 
Amachi was galaxies away from anything that they had experienced before. Imagine essentially a windblown desert in southeastern Colorado. This is a part of the country that had just gone through the Dust Bowl. It was very hot in summer, very cold in the winter, and we weren't prepared for, for that. I mean, because we never knew, we didn't know where we were going when we left. The living quarters for the, the Japanese in Amachi uh, were pretty Spartan. Uh, they were military-style barracks, uh, which had five or six apartments. Each apartment would have a family of anywhere between three and seven and sometimes nine people, multi-generations living in one, not only in one apartment, but in one room. There were no partitions except for the improvised partitions of bed sheets that were placed across spaces to create a little bit of privacy. You have a bare bulb, you've got a, um, a potbelly stove, and you've got metal cots that have been given to you by the army. That is it. You do not have any place to put your clothes. You do not have a desk. You do not have a table. Um, all of that stuff, the internees had to provide for themselves, and they built them out of scrap and um, shipping crates and um, you know whatever they could scramble together. We weren't supposed to take the scrap lumber, but we did some midnight requisition made our own furniture, very crude. Denver Post, at that time, it wasn't under Palmer Hoyt. They were very, very, I think they put out an article one time that our, uh, our sewage system, whatever it was, that tank thing, that we had a swimming pool there, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had no kitchen or anything. They had a mess hall, so with about 250 people living in a block. We had to go in two shifts. You would line up in long lines and and uh, you were given a tray when you walked in, and walk along and they would just throw the food on. There was no choice in terms of food. I mean, you took what, you, what was dished out, get some strange foods that we had never seen before, you know. Liver and onions, for example, chicken gizzards. <laughs> you know. But if you didn't eat, uh, you know, you can go home to, I mean, go back to your barrack or room, and there was no refrigerator or anything like that, so just went hungry. So ironically enough, the, the United States government felt that it was imperative to teach these loyal American citizens of the uh, value of self-government and democracy. Each block elected representatives that served on essentially a town council. Uh, and so the, the civilian affairs of the camp were governed by the Japanese internees themselves. There was a civilian police force, there was a fire department. It was every town USA, uh, except that there were machine guns trained on you. That loss of freedom, you know, here they are, two thirds of them are American citizens, and particularly the older of those, um, they're, they're well aware of what's going on to them. Every morning, we pledge our allegiance to the flag, and we, of course, ended up with, with liberty and justice for all. And, you know, we got so we would almost shout out the words justice, freedom, and justice for all, because we knew we were behind barbed wires. We, we knew we were under guard. I mean, the MPs were always there. One middle schooler named Tom Shikaguni wrote an essay that was critical of conscription for the Japanese Americans. And uh, his teacher asked him to talk about the paper after class. And he said, I, I don't believe that the government should uh, conscript Japanese Americans until they return us to America. The teacher replied in saying, well, you know, you're, we're keeping you here for your protection. There are people outside of the fence um, who want to hurt you. And his response was, uh, then why are you pointing the machine guns inside? It's a very meager um, existence in terms of what they came to. Now, what they were able to do with that, again, um, is, uh, is amazing to me and um, how immediately they're organizing sewing clubs and artist guilds and photography groups 
and they're doing kabuki theater and they're learning traditional dance and they have a, they make a sumo ring and they recreate a town and really take that so the things that were ha that were really livable about camp were the things that they made the things that they did there was a hospital on the camp but the regular course of life continued there were births marriages deaths um, all of the things that you would normally uh, have, all of the passages that you would normally have in your life took place in Amanchi. They just happened to take place behind barbed wire. In Amanchi, they finally started something called a co-op. It was a place where people could, could go and, and, and buy items. Actually, it was three barracks that were put together and that, were, that became the, the co-op stores, so to speak. They yeah, had shoe repair shop and jewelry repair and, you know, a few other things like that. You know, that they took this place and instead of burning their barracks down because they were mad, they instead made it a more lovely um, place. And so it's a complex sort of history of both sort of tradition and change and um, pride in who they were as people of Japanese ancestry, but also pride of who they were as Americans. Everything was provided for the Japanese in this camp. That was one of the ways that the government tried to sell the camp. Everything will be taken care of. We'll pay for your shelter. We'll pay for your food. Uh, you won't have to do dishes. Uh, you won't have to clean your bathroom. But of course, all of that had a corrosive effect on the family structure. It took away the responsibilities of women in the family. Uh, they didn't have to cook. They didn't have to clean. They didn't have to do anything. So they, had a, they struggled with a sense of who they were in these camps. There was patriotism there, but there was also a cultural respect for authority. Authority was something that was exercised in the family by the father, and that family authority broke down in the camps. And it broke down because all of a sudden the teenagers were eating over here and the parents were eating over here, and so that, that cohesiveness within the family broke down. Many of them were separated because their, their father was considered a, a threat. So they were sent to more of a prison style type of a camp. I, this one particular woman, I, I, she said, yeah, my, my grandfather was sent there. I said, well, so I got I, I to gotta ask, why was he deemed a threat? And she goes, well, he, he fought in the Japanese army during the Russian-Japanese war. And I said, really? I mean, he's got to be, he had to be really, oh yeah, he was 67 years old, he couldn't walk, and he was blind. And I said, and he was deemed a threat because he was in the military for the Japanese. He said, yes. They're definitely under surveillance, but this is a time of extreme labor shortage, and these are people who know how to grow things. And so even before they get to the permanent internment camps, even when they're in the assembly centers, which are the sort of temporary places they're first sent to, they're already getting work permits to go out and do farm work because the farms need them. Early on, the camp was uh, closely guarded by a detachment of military, army people. Uh, but that was soon relinquished to uh, uh, civilian administrators. And the, uh, it relaxed a little bit. They're also getting permits to leave the camp to shop. So they're going into nearby Grenada. So one of the things that makes Amachi different than the other nine camps is that there's a town very nearby. And that town in, ends up with an interesting symbiotic relationship with the camp. People could leave the camp as they did, which was to our good fortune, and come into town and buy the things they needed. There were stores in, um, in, in Lamar that would say, we don't, you know, we don't serve Japs and we don't, et cetera. Barbershop would put up a sign saying, well, we have a Jap hunting license, like that, you know. We would see signs, no Japs, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You just turn a blind what's it. And later on, when we were in camp, other people had told us, don't go to this store, don't go to that store, you know, we said, okay. Well, pretty soon the signs start coming down, because now they had no business, right? But we had long memories, you know. Nope, 
we're not going over there, we're not going over there, we're not going to say anything, but we're not going over there. Our, our nearest movie theater was in Lamar, 17 miles west, the Pioneer Theater, and every week there was some sort of propaganda film, especially about the war in the Pacific. Uh, I remember those rather vividly. We never made the connection between those propaganda films and the people who were residing in this camp. It seemed like a totally different world, totally different people to us. As a result of that, I developed, I think, a healthy and lifelong uh, skepticism about what our government tells us. Some of the things that's amazing about Amache is that it has the greatest number of all of the 10 internment camps, the highest percentage of people who enlist for the military. Over 10% of the people who passed through that camp went to war, and they went to war for the U.S., even though they themselves were imprisoned. My brother was one of the first, among the first group, to volunteer. They sent him to what they call military intelligence because they wanted people who could speak Japanese. That's a very little, little known story in, in, our, in our history books. There was a great deal of, of conflict going on within the families when the their sons would say, you know, I'm going to join the military. There were people who said, you're, you're crazy. Look, you know, look around you. I mean, you, look what they've done to us. I, I know of one instance where the father dis disowned the son. And that, that boy was killed in France. He died. And much later on, after the, after the camps and you were released and, and the fellow was, was living back in California, the father committed suicide. And I'm sure it's because he had disowned his son and his son had been killed. Those who remained behind by the end of the war um, had to leave because the camp closed down in October of 1945. And as early as August 1945, the federal government was saying, hey, you've got to find somewhere else to live. You can't stay here. We're not going to support this camp after the war. They were giving them $25 and a train ticket. You know, if you're from California and you want to go back there, here's 25 bucks and a train ticket. People simply wouldn't hire them, wouldn't rent to them. And, you know, word like that gets back to the camp. And, they, and so a lot of people were apprehensive. They said they didn't want to leave the camp. A lot of people ended up in trailer camps, so-called trailer camps. And others ended up in, you know, like hostels, you know, um, churches. Um, they were, they were basically homeless. Governor Carr's courageous efforts on behalf of, of the Japanese Americans cost him dearly in terms of his political career. The lesson from someone like Ralph Carr is, is a simple one, and that is that you have to do the right thing. You have to respect other people. You have to be true to your heart, even when everyone around you is telling you that that's not the way to go. And even if you know that that truth may come at a great cost to yourself personally. Everything from the camp has been removed completely because I think everyone wanted it to be like, this never happened, America's the same, no blemish there. I don't think you go to a mate and you're not moved by um, by it. Whether it's it's sort of um, the kind of ghosts that are there now with the sort of empty space that is that has remained empty. To me, what we're finding is really important, but it's also the process is really important because we're building community and a place where we can talk about the issues that are underneath all of this, which is who belongs in America, and what do we do when we're scared and what a dangerous 
dangerous mix it is to have, you know, sort of racism be thrown in with hysteria. No good ever comes of that. It can happen again, and it can happen in different ways. It can happen to different groups of people. Uh, prejudice is an ugly thing, and it rears its head all the time in this country. This is an issue that that the, the America has not really resolved. I got more upset with people not knowing what happened more than anything else. That's part of history, and I think it's important that you do remember that, it's just like with the Native Americans, you know, the Trail of Tears, and then all of the other things. I think history, correct history, is very important. It's important to remember a place like Amachi because it's a place that, that uh, reminds us of the balance between security and liberty. Uh, we are, as a nation, uh, stand for liberty, but the liberty of the men and women and children who were placed in this camp uh, was sacrificed in the name of national security. And those are questions which still uh, haunt us today, questions that, that we still grope for the answers for. It's what you teach your kids. You know, if you believe in education, you get them and you get all the things, they will do okay. If things like that are happening, we need to speak up, speak out, and do something. And you, you cannot just ignore it, you know, you cannot. And they shouldn't feel badly about something that happened 70 years ago, my goodness. But they should remember so it doesn't happen again. Colorado Experience is a co-production of Rocky Mountain PBS and History Colorado. History Colorado brings history to life for audiences of all ages. Through exhibits, collections, and historic preservation programs throughout the state, History Colorado connects people to the stories, places, and heritage of Colorado's past that provide perspectives on today and inspire our choices for tomorrow. Find out more at www.historycolorado.org. Additional funding provided by El Pomar Foundation and the Betcher Foundation, celebrating 75 years of philanthropy in Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations and from viewers like you, thank you. This episode is available on Blu-ray. Visit our website to order. There's more Colorado experience online at rmpbs.org slash Colorado Experience, Facebook and Twitter.